Hold it. Don't hold it by the wing. Hold it by the body. There. A lot of people say, what's the favorite toy you guys have ever done? And it's, it's always quite an easy answer for me. I always say the Sky Shark, which was the very first Airhawks plane because it was done with so much heart and so much love. I, I almost get emotional when I think about it because it was like a real toy and none of us could have done it without the other. Are you ready? Benny and I met in university at business school. We were in the same class in the second year, and uh, we started to become pretty close. And he heard I had great study notes, so he befriended me. He had no interest in being my friend. He simply wanted the study notes. He was relentless in, he would call me every single day, every single day. I met Anton when I was uh, 11 at camp. And, uh, and the funniest thing was basically Anton and I were very competitive in high school and we basically said we never went to business together. My mom was chasing us, as she always does, chasing us because she had a really great idea from Israel. And what was that idea and, how, and we should all listen to it. And she called her famous family meeting. It was an article in an Israeli paper um, that possibly every Israeli person in North America read and it basically said, described a, a, an item, it was called grass head. And then I went to Anton and said to him, what do you think? And he was like, I don't know, I <laughs> know, like, I don't know, <laughs> you know. I think Anton at the time, he was, he was still deciding whether or not he was gonna go corporate. And in classic Anton form, it takes him a while to get on board, but once he's on board, you know, he's like charging, hard charging. This is a dream come true, and uh, I feel that I'm climbing a mountain right now, and I'm about to hit the top, I'm just about to hit the top, and I don't want anything to knock me down. It's like a game of chess. You know, there's so, there's so many pawns and so many players. I love the game of business, the puzzle, the interaction with people, the influence with people. That's just who I am. That's my tick. Uh, the competition uh, really gets me juiced, and the game gets me juiced. Welcome to the most recent craze on the novelty market, Earth Buddies. And it's a craze that is translating into big orders and big bucks. Anton was always focused on just sales and growth. That was his focus. He wanted to grow and market, and everything he did was focused on that. Renan wasn't always known for handling the back end of the company, the operations, uh, he d you know, did a great job with licensing, and people don't r know that Renan made the biggest sale in our company history to Kmart. You know, he's a great salesperson, but he does it a totally different way. I don't even remember why or how I ended up being the one to actually go down and, and do the sale at Kmart. And the craziest thing was when I walked in the office, she actually had um, about eight other competitive samples sitting at the corner of her desk. So I had a certain price in my mind and I dropped the price 30% as soon as I saw the samples. <laughs> and I did the pitch and she, after about 45 minutes, she was a lovely lady, after about 45 minutes, she said, okay, I'm gonna give you an order for 48,000 pieces, and if you ship it and if it goes well, I'm gonna give you an order for half a million pieces. We actually had to make 200,000 pieces on spec because we didn't have the physical purchase order from, from Kmart until like September. So we basically doubled down and, and uh, did whatever was possible to, to make it happen. I know, okay, I'll make a note, we'll get a dustpan. <laughs> But in the meantime, look at the ingenuity. I mean, do we really need the dustpan? You'd never think about Ben running a factory, but he did a great job for about nine months. I can tell you I was terrible at manufacturing. I didn't know anything about it, and I was completely, totally, and utterly flying by the seat of my pants. But we have to buy forward. We have to buy dollars. 
right? Because we want to protect ourselves against the exchange rate. I'm telling you, we're gonna, we could get creamed. Totally wipe out every what penny we pay. My mom, mom yeah, it? my mom said it's very vital that we do it. Originally, we did not buy our hosiery in bulk. So we would literally, I would go to the bay and I would buy all their hosiery. I would walk up to the counter with stacks and stacks of boxes of hosiery and the lady would look at me like, what do you do? Like you're, what do you possibly, could you possibly need this for? Just repeat that to me again, you guys want a? A collect cost. You have a um, prepaid cost of $1.60. Right. Transportation is calling it and they need a collect cost. I have to go to my accounts receivable department. I don't understand what it means. I don't understand either. They want a collect cost. So their cost, our cost to ship it or their cost to ship it? There wasn't a lot of sleep during that time. Everything was so new and fresh. And there was definitely a lot of, of stepping on each other's toes um, at the early days. And that caused a lot of fighting and disagreements and stuff like that. Everybody wanted to be in everybody's space. Everybody always knew better. Do you know who runs, who runs night packing? Tommy Bell. If there's a problem on packing, I go to Tommy no, Bell. But does he have and a strict set of policies to go on? No. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need it, Anton. Anton, you're just into putting in systems that we don't we need. Don't need. We went literally from five people to 10 people to 20 people to 30 people. We, we were hiring so quickly, and most of them were homeless people from a shelter called Seton House. And one day, this guy walks up to me, and his name was Bob Wakelam, I'll never forget. He was really polite, I remember, he was incredibly polite. He said, I don't mean to barge in on you, I was in my office, I was probably on the verge of tears. And he says, I worked in manufacturing my whole life, and I was a uh, plant manager, and I, and I worked supply chain, and he said, I, he says, I think I can really give you a hand. And he was kind of like the homeless guy who really could have been running the country. And I came in the next day, and my office was completely covered in charts. Eyes chart, work in process chart, here's how much sawdust we have, this is when we're gonna run out. I couldn't see a spot of wall, and I was completely flabbergasted. I was just like, I couldn't believe it. It was like manna from the heavens, because we were, I was drowning, and here was the rope, the safety line, that came in and saved me. It's been very uplifting here. Um, working with these young people has inspired me to uh, sort of change my lifestyle back to the swing of it, being unemployed for three years. So it's been excellent. I think the reason we even considered being a toy company is Earth Buddy and the next product, Devil Sticks, which Renan had found, um, were sold into toy departments. So the toy buyers started to say, what do you guys have next? And at that time, we were looking at a million different businesses. And I remember I really liked the idea of becoming a toy company. Come in. Give it a go. You're on tape now. Oh, oh, this man's the greatest. Oh, God, look at this guy here. First time I met the guys at Spin Master was one of their first toy fairs where they were uh, doing devil sticks. And I remember meeting Benny in the hallway and him saying to, come in, come in, you gotta see this, you gotta see this. And him selling the product that's been around for a hundred years. Um, they had a little ding dong showroom and you'd go in there and you'd think, oh my goodness, what are you gonna do this year? And we were in the back corner, I remember. We weren't even in the front. So in walked these two inventors named Dixon Manning. Renan, who do we have here? You have the very famous, <laughs> infamous, Peter Manning, John Dixon from Dixon Manning. Somebody said there's three crazy young kids from Canada that are looking for a new original product. And so we said, let's go show them. And they pull out this plane, and it's a pop bottle with these foam, giant foam wings, and they had a huge bicycle pump and they pump up this thing and they spin the propeller and you can, and you can see, that they had this little one piston engine, you could see the engine going. It was t absolutely magical. Oh yeah, it looked really hokey. I mean, you know, the, the boys looked like they were just out of school, which obviously they were. Um, their enthusiasm was amazing. Uh, and that's probably what uh, carried us forward because 
I mean, they had very little experience in the toy business, that was for sure. Uh, but they had enthusiasm, yeah. Something should have dawned on me. And this is probably where having no experience helped. Shouldn't it have dawned on me that we were the last stop and not the first stop? Like, if these guys are coming to see us, is that a good sign? And I never even thought about it. <laughs> None of us thought about it. Well, we, we, we took it everywhere. Um, we, we took it to every single major toy company, um, from Mattel down to, you know, some fairly um, uh, mundane people that were in aeroplanes. And they all paid us a lot of money to keep it, to review it, uh, but never bought it. So they send in the prototype and this thing arrives in the mail and uh, I took it across the street to fly to Palmerston Public School and this kid comes over and he says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm flying this plane. And he says, where did you get it? And I said, Toys R Us. And he said, no you didn't. He said, that's a toy of the future. <laughs> and I kind of realized at that moment, maybe we have something really magical. If you're asking whether I, we thought that the product was good, the answer was yes. Whether we thought they were capable of manufacturing it, uh, the answer to that has to be, uh, it was very doubtful. We'd never done something before that cost $400,000 in R&D dollars and, and work with factories in China to actually get it produced. We, we basically went to school. We, we taught ourselves the, the hard part about designing and developing. I remember calling him and he was in China and it sounded like he was up to his neck in mud and sinking. I feel that 1996 was the toughest year of the company ever. We um, didn't have the strategy, didn't have the product with all these overheads, all these, you know, the people, the salaries, the infrastructure, you know, the relationships in China, uh, they definitely, you definitely build up a reputation. And they have to believe in you, and they believe in the company, and these factories need to take risk. So there was a lot of effort on their part to get behind your product. It's really, really, very complex. And we spend a lot of time in the factory in order to make it work their desire to, to win is aligned with, with our desire to win. So we were 100% um, on the same track. When we got the first set of box, first set of air hogs back from the factory, and we opened up a bunch of them, like six of them, and we flew them and they all flew perfectly. I'm very pleased to take this opportunity to introduce you to a very new and exciting toy that we're working on called the Turbo Air Jet. That moment was a moment of incredible gravity and it just, the inertia pulled us through the next really two years of really great like sales and growth and it was like within a couple months we were in Time Magazine, in the Globe and Mail, in the New York Times, in USA Today. The pinnacle was really in 1999 when Popular Science named it one of the 100 best achievements in science and technology of the year.
There were periods after Air Hogs where I was hiring someone almost every day. We were hiring and hiring and hiring. It was like the parents had gone away for a weekend and you know, it left you a list of chores that you didn't really know how to get done because there weren't any grown-ups around to tell you how to get it done. I could see the shock on everyone's face as they joined Spin Master. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe they run a meeting this way. Well, I would say that as much success as we had, we had royal mess-ups, like, all the time. We never get on the PA system and you hear, Przansky Perez upstairs. It was like, you know, being called to task to the principal's office. There were a lot of heated debates. There were a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of chairs being thrown, a lot of things that uh, wouldn't happen in traditional corporate worlds. You wore every hat, and people were quick to uh, chip in and help, but you, did, you were up to here in everything all the time. I was hired originally as a demonstrator to literally play with the toys for $15 an hour, I think it was at the time, and do tricks on my BMX bike. And the next thing I knew, I was a brand manager, totally unqualified. The people who worked hard got an opportunity to work on the most exciting projects in the company and be right on the forefront. So if you start in shipping, your ability to progress and become a vice president of the company um, is huge. I mean, there was a time where I kind of made it a mistake and I gave out too many VP titles. <laughs> And I, and I did cause, cause some challenges there. Uh, uh. <laughs> we were growing from 50 million to 100 million, from 100 million to 160 million. Then in 2003, we doubled from over 150 million to 300 million. Uh, they should be proud of themselves. And I, not, not just of the business, but proud of themselves. And I mean that. Sally, you're the best. With Spin Master, the business is built around friendship. They seem to uh, just intuitively know that if you build good relationships with people, that business will naturally flow from there. And let me tell you, he's been seeing us oh. since I knocked on his door. For my first time, we had nothing. We had maybe one item, and Shelly had me in and showed us product. These guys uh, were presenting products like they were going to change the world. And you knew then straight away that this company was really going somewhere. Figures, new series. We got Matt it was fun because they were young and, and uh, excited and, and uh, you know, brought a lot of passion to the business. The reception on the motocross bikes has been unbelievable. Ben still looks at products like a little child, through a child's eyes. He never lost his enthusiasm, his... Uh, his sparkle, and it's so much fun and such a pleasure to show Ben Verdi something. Like so, let him go, and look at that. Oh. <laughs> I think we're, we're wow sluts. And what I mean by that is, we don't create a category so much as if we see an item, or a product, or a line that we think is amazing, and it happens to fall outside of a category that we're already in, we're not scared to try it. the Airhawks RC wall race. Now last time I brought you an RC Regis, you ran it into the wall. Yeah, uh, So this, this time we can do this. Oh no, there we go. Oh, no! You can... Wow! And you know what? If you look carefully in there, you can see your future. And the 1999 Young Entrepreneur of the Year is Anton Rabi, Runan Harari, and Ben Varaby. When you look back, you, you love to talk about the successes because they bring good feelings and good memories. You don't often talk about the clunkers, and there will always be more clunkers than there are successes. You know, a lot of, a lot of people don't know the failures of the company. I mean, Don't Free Freddy, Key Charm Cuties. I mean, I keep every failure in my office up above because every day 
you know, one needs to remind oneself of your failures for the learnings and for the, the humility. Around the world, they're among the most popular arts and crafts toys for kids. Aqua dots stick together when water is added. But now a Chinese manufacturer is accused of replacing glue in the aqua dots with a toxic chemical. Without a doubt, the lowest point in Spin Master history was uh, the whole aqua dots thing, scenario, debacle, I don't know what you want to call it, disaster. And uh, it was a terrible, terrible time because there's, what's the worst thing that can happen? The, the second worst thing that can happen is the toy fails and you'll lose a lot of money. The worst thing that can happen is that a child gets hurt. It could be any product. If it affects kids and it hurts kids, it's going to affect everybody, okay? And I will be honest, I believed in this product. I believed in this product 150%. Um, that was the correct thing, but us not manufacturing it was not the correct thing. And from that day on, every single department learned how to step up the game and how to be better at what we did going forward. I can see the thread of what goes into success and what the thread that goes into failure. And to me, the, the biggest thing is, is the attention to detail. You gotta put a lot of love and care. Um, it's gotta be perfect. Oh, yeah, dude. Reputation is huge in the industry because concepts come out of your mouth and then they're out. You might not know exactly how to do it, but if it comes out of your mouth, it's out. At the end of the day, you really want to work with someone you can trust. We did a product called the Storm Launcher. We actually found the Storm Launcher on YouTube. It was a, it was a viral video of this really cool boat that turns into an airplane. And we wanted to do the product. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, when you deal with inventors, sometimes you actually have a fair amount of um, leverage over them. And it would have been very easy for us to just go ahead and do the product. And at the insistence of Benny himself, um, said, no, the right thing to do is to track this guy down and to do a licensing agreement with him. And that's what we did. I think they're very collaborative. A lot of the toy companies we work with sometimes will take the product we'll never see it again, and then suddenly we see it at Toy Fair. And either we're crying because it's horrible, or we're thrilled because it's great. Spin is very different. They want to collaborate, they want to show you what they're doing, and they want to get the feedback from you as an original creator. What I love about Ben is um, this concept I, I call from um, brilliant to ridiculous. And to get brilliant ideas, you have to be very comfortable with ridiculous ideas. And Ben, it's just so comfortable with the ridiculous, because anyone can have good ideas, but to get to the brilliant ones, you really have to be comfortable with that ridiculous. It's a P-Boss, and we're bringing you our debut CD. We will hear such soon-to-be classic songs as Kung Fu You. I'm a bit of a failed artsy myself. I'm not, I don't, think of the core of being of myself as like a businessman, right? Like, I think I'm an okay businessman, but where my heart really lies is in creating things, right? I think the inventors responded to that in a big, big, big way. Bakugan came to us in the form of a sketch. Uh, from a gentleman by the name of Shelley Goldberg. We worked on it for a long time, but we didn't quite think we were there. We hadn't quite um, got it to the point where we felt, wow, this is just amazing, we're good to go. And Renan in a meeting said, I think we should pay. We need something extra. I think it would be great to partner with a Japanese company and give it that anime manga flair. There's such a rich history of toys and animation coming out of Japan that it was just a natural thing to go there and just check it out and see what was going on. So on, on one of my trips over there, we presented it to Mr. Kokoban, who was a real toy legend, like a hardcore toy guy. So we gave, gave him the samples, and literally two months later, he came back to Japan and they incorporated the whole pop-open transformation, the whole rolling it onto the card and having the metal inside the card and the whole point system and the battling, and they took it from here 
to here. And then from there, I turned to him and I said to him, well, what do you think about doing a 52 episode uh, animation? And he said, yeah, it sounds great. It will cost about $12 million and uh, you know, we'll come in for half. I said, well, okay, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> what are you gonna do? The odds are stacked against you. Back against the wall. It's magic. You're trying to get across magic. I think Bakugan had magic when it when the thing landed on the card and it opened on its own so quickly, like <laughs> there was a robot inside or a monster inside. That's magic. I've pitched this to people 55 plus countries around the world, and every time it was the same. This transcended borders. This was truly unique. As much as Air Hogs changed the company in 97, Bakugan was the only other thing that had the same effect. It's truly the next generation of Pokemon, and it's just been blown off the shelves. This is the hottest thing on the toy market right now. I'll tell you something, we were having success, and success is a drug, and it's an addictive drug, and it's the most addictive drug there is. So when you are having, the, the sales were going up for the most part, in the early years especially. So because the sales were going up, we just pushed harder and harder and harder. I'm riding my luck, I'm taking my chances. With all the odds in my favor, I lay my money down. The company doubled within 21 months. The whole organization doubled from 450 million over 800 million because of Bakugan. I'm shooting for the moon, taking a gamble on you. It was a rocket ship, the growth, and we would meet almost every 30 days to decide how much we were willing to ship. And so we just kept growing the number, 50 million, 80 million, 100 million, 150 million. If I'm in control when I roll the dice, I'm placing my bets, I'm playing my aces, laying my cards on the table. What more can I do? I'm taking a gamble on you. When you grow three, four hundred million dollars, in in theory, you need to have one person for every million dollars. So we needed to hire three, 300 people. And we were hiring several people a week. We were hiring people to hire people. We had this huge budget huge sales goal that we set and in my gut I felt that that was way too high of a number and I remember I went to Hong Kong okay and I came back and I said to the guys I'm like there is no way we're gonna achieve these types of numbers it's just not going to happen the toy industry also has a dark side last year's toy nobody wants there are very few brands in the toy industry. There are very few toys that actually keep going year after year after year. The cart was always moving with the horse, but it stopped and uh, you know, it was a, a disaster. If it stops, how do you replace that volume, knowing that what you've also done is created a great deal of internal overhead to feed the monster? We had uh, the cold reality, you know, looking into the precipice of, you know, death. It was that bad because we hired all those people. And when you don't do 300 million worth of business that you're planning to do, that means you have 300 people more than you can afford. Yeah, it definitely causes you to reflect on everything. And you don't even necessarily reflect on the right things. I think they question their partnership. I think they question their 
uh, everything at that point. The first time I was contacted by Anton, I was on a business trip in Mexico, and I just agreed to come in for an hour because I figure out if I don't come, he'll never stop uh, calling me. Then on my first day, I'm realizing we just done three rounds of restructuring, the morale is way down. I remember um, being at Spin Master for four days, I called my wife and I said this was a huge mistake. Most business that go through what Spin Master have gone through in those two years don't come back. Fixing the core is, it requires a lot, of, a lot of tough conversation. It requires people sometimes changing how they do, how they look at their business every day. We really needed to completely change how the business was running. I started to feel very optimistic that, um, that Spin Master was going to be able to come back, bounce back, and come, and come back stronger than it has ever been. When finally Anton, Benny, Renan, and I had some alignment, and they literally says, okay, we're going to go do what needs to be done. What's the, what's the map? Where, who needs to do what? How is that going to work? And we agreed on the plan. Ben's been able to take the edge off things. He brings another perspective into the room and he comes with a lot of experience and we can defer a lot of things. A lot of things for him to just decide and, and what it's enabled us to do is each of us collectively to really play and work in our strengths. You know, he's, he's got incredible experience and he deals with the three of us like no one else. You know, based on his judgment, his experience, his abilities, he's the right guy at the right time. Chaos drives all the innovation, but uncontrolled chaos creates a lot of waste. And, and one of the things that we've been able to do is to actually control that chaos and let the business be chaotic where it needs to be chaotic and then put some guardrail around that chaos so that we can actually maximize the return as we go forward. AirHogs was a real achievement in terms of designing and developing a great toy. Bakugan um, gave us the ability to have characters, storyline, so it really launched us into the whole entertainment space. They have figured out a way to develop toys with inventors and then bring in great people to make stories around them. Spin Master really has become this global entertainment company and not just a toy company. I think Spin Master has an incredible way of bringing that wow moment to the table. It 
It's an interesting opportunity in, with Meccano. Here we had this golden opportunity of a, of a legacy brand, a name that's been around for years, but we almost had a blank sheet of paper of what we could do to take it forward. We saw it as an engineering brand, it's about real engineering. Now it's 2014, you know, there, there was also electrical engineering, there was software engineering, and then also it really gave us an opportunity to push out the tech side of things into to new areas where we really think we can kind of push the boundaries. I think we're starting to really shake up the toy industry. So I don't think it's coming down to who's bigger. I think it's really coming down to who's better. The joke we like to make is, you know, you, you say, well, it's not rocket science. Actually, Air Hogs is rocket science. It's a fun place to work, you know, it's, it's never a dull moment. I mean, they're, you know, we're constantly changing as a company. I challenge anybody to find a company in Canada that's as varied as this one. Nice work, team. We started the Spin Master Innovation Fund, which is to help young entrepreneurs get them going, get them started, and how do you, how do you get the advice to take your business from from A to C. And that's really what, what we try to do with the fund is, is open ourselves up and open up all our staff to share that information with, with young entrepreneurs. I think that the Spin Master story is such a great Canadian story. I think every Canadian needs to hear it and I think every Canadian should be proud of it. Uh, me included, of course, and especially I'm part of it now. When I come into work every day, the thing that I'm just the most proud of, and that's our legacy, is how we've treated people, how the three of us have uh, been unwavering to each other. You know, I, I can say, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of how we've transformed ourselves, bringing in people who are smarter than us, and given these people the, uh, the space, the freedom, the tools, to achieve great results. You know, uh, hire the best and get out of their way. And we've done that. To me, the next chapter in the book is us starting to pass the torch on to other people. And I think for good and for bad, for better and for worse, we've gotten the company to where it is today. and and. I'm very excited to see a lot of great people that have been here a long time really starting to step up and, uh, and I know that they're stepping up because they're saying no to me more often. I think that the company is, um, uh, you know, it's now going into its, its adulthood. It's so strong, it's got a great reputation, and so we want to build on that. We're just getting started. <laughs> yeah. I would like to sort of um, quote Winston Churchill in a speech he made uh, after the Battle of Britain. Never in the toy industry 
has so much been achieved by so few in such a short time and with so little of previous experience. We just wanted to tell Ben and Anton and Ronan that from our hearts that we are so proud of you and we love you all. It's been a hell of a 20 years. Uh, started out in New York with a bang. We've had some great times, some great memories, and uh, proud to be a part of it. The last 15 years have been sensational, and please God another 15. Thank you, guys. It's been a great ride. Thank you for bringing me on to the company. Uh, best decision I ever made. Why have I stayed so long? Whew. Not a day goes by where I don't ask that question. Well, they may not want me at 75, but I would love to be part of the company when I am 75. Happy birthday, guys. Thanks for not firing me many, many times over. The Spin Master definitely changed my life forever. Really happy that I'm here. This is a remarkable time in the history of your business, and 20 years is a remarkable milestone. And you three as partners are a remarkable partnership. A hearty congratulations. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Renan, Anton, and Ben. Happy birthday to you.